All right, welcome back to CS4510, Lecture 19B. This is a, probably going to be a short lecture. It's on circuit lower bounds, or the lack thereof of them. Um, so we talked last time about circuits. We talked about p slash poly. We talked about you know the, the non-uniform model of computation. We talked about a comparison between... Uh, P slash poly and P. And, you know, maybe SAT is really hard to prove that it has no, um, like the lower bound on the running time of SAT is exponential or at least super polynomial. That might be hard to prove. Fine. Maybe we can prove that, like, uh, SAT has no small circuits. Maybe we can prove that there's no polynomial sized circuits for SAT. That would be convenient. That would be kind of like showing P does not equal NP, because at least it doesn't have small circuits. Maybe in this restricted model of computation, that's sufficient for us. I also want to mention that circuits are far more wieldly device than Turing machines. What does a random, if I ask you to sample and give me a random program, a random Turing machine, what does that mean? Not a program that takes randomness, but give me a random program. Not obvious what it is. What's the probability you give me a random program and it halts? I don't know how to measure that. I don't know what that means. If I, give you, if I ask for a random circuit, far easier. Just fix the size. Choose each gate independently. Suppose the topology is fixed in some pattern. And then you, now you can talk about a random circuit. You can talk about circuits in that way, in a way you can't talk about machines. You can also induct on circuits. You can perform proof by induction on the circuits, right? Certain circuits certainly have to be composed of other smaller circuits that compute the same function. And a lot of the circuits that people have studied are subject to these kinds of proof by induction. Like, for example, if there was a circuit for SAT, then the, consider the circuit of size n, which solves SAT on n variables. Perhaps as a subcircuit, it has to solve SAT on n minus 1 variables and so on. So there's inductive arguments you can make about the size of these circuits as well. And then you can measure the increase in the induction. Congrats, you have a growth rate in the, in, the, in the circuits. If that growth rate is exponential or polynomial, is the, then you, have a, you can bound the complexity of the circuit. You can't really do that with, mach, with these uniform machines because I don't know what the, it's like looping and stuff, and it's like, what's going on? You know, I, don't know, I don't really know. Um, but hopefully, and we won't, and we can't, show that SAT doesn't have polynomial sized circuits. But that's the motivation for trying to show circuit lower bounds because we basically failed to show. Uh, algorithmic lower bounds. Why did we fail to do that? Because of the relativization barrier. All the programs, all the, th all the theorems that we have, basically, all of them appear to relativize. Uh, but circuit ones, note that they sp explicitly did not relativize. Why? When we convert a uh, computation of, a, of a, uh, the computation history of a machine into a circuit, uh, that, such, that proof would not work for an oracle machine, because how would you convert the oracle call into a, a circuit? It doesn't really... You can't really do it. So the circuit results immediately appear to avoid the relativization barrier. And there is motivation like, OK, rel the relativization, relativization barrier was in 1975, immediately after people spent time trying to find uh, circuit lower bounds. Because um, that was where e everyone was headed. Everyone wants to solve P versus NP. This relativization barrier was a cultural shift. And it stopped people from working on those kinds of elementary results uh, that had served so well in computability theory and were trying to go into this direction. Um, a final thing I want to say about circuits is there's really, we live in discrete math, and there's not really many tools we have. There's really two subjects you can take uh, in discrete math, and that's either, uh, the subject is either one of logic or one of combinatorics. That's it. So logic you take, can take in like half of this class and not anymore, and we've sort of exhausted the tools from it. Uh, that means we have to look to combinatorics, and that means we have to look at more common, simpler combinatorial structures, which have to, can only be the... Um, circuits, basically, right? Uh, these are the only two fields of, of discrete math. Any, sub, any field, any class you could take in discrete math probably has to fall into one of these fields, right? I'm really trying hard to think of one that's not one of these two fields, and I think, or maybe some elementary results in abstract algebra or something like this, some triangles, right, trivial stuff, but it's got to be from here, okay? So uh, let's begin with the model. First, we want to consider the functions and then think about the circuits that can compute them. So uh, a Boolean function uh, 
is a function which takes on uh, n inputs and outputs one bit as the output. Right. Now, note the function, a Boolean function is not a circuit. It is a description of a function. It is not a circuit yet. Not been realized as a circuit. It is simply a list of the inputs and outputs, right? The best way to think of a Boolean function is not as a circuit, but as a truth table. We all know what a truth table looks like, right? Uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, right? And then here, so those are the three inputs. Let's say we were considering some Boolean function of like uh, f takes on three bits and outputs one bit, right? The truth table, the description of this function would be a truth table like this. Something like that, right? Um, it doesn't even need to be useful or anything, but the description of the function is certainly is in a truth table. Um, so given a Boolean function, a description of, and you can even have a high-level description of a Boolean function. You can say the Boolean function is parity, computes the XORs or whatever. Um, given the description of the function, you're concerned with what are the smallest circuits that can compute that function, right? Um, so uh, we're going to talk first, before we talk about lower bounds on circuits, we want to talk about upper bounds. Um, how can we create a circuit given any Boolean function? So certainly every Boolean function is computable by some circuit, not necessarily a circuit family, because then you could talk about the families of the Boolean function, but just consider some fixed Boolean function. It's encoded in a truth table this way. The two, if, it takes, if the function takes on n bits, what's the size of the truth table? Yeah, it's got 2 to the n if it takes on n bits. How can we build a circuit to compute this truth table, basically? How can we, compute, how can we create a Boolean circuit to compute uh, a truth table, a, a Boolean function? Right? We can be concerned with the smallest ones later, but first we want to show that every Boolean function is computable by some Boolean circuit. Um, and I claim that every Boolean function is computable by a circuit of size n to the 2 to the n. Right. Uh, terrible large upper bound on the size of a circuit, but certainly is a upper bound. How we're going to do this is what we're going to do is just take the truth table and convert it to a circuit. So what you're going to do is like, um, let's say the row of the truth table was like, I don't know, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, that, that, that. And then out here is an output wire of 1. And that there are some rows above and some rows below it. Right, we're looking at a row of the truth table. What you're going to do is you're going to and you want to make sure that you create a circuit for each row, and then unless the specific sequence of input wires is exactly that row, all the other rows should turn off except this one. So what you're going to do is like you're going to and all these together. That's going to say and. Then you're going to negate and and all the other ones together. You guys know what this notation means? Those are negated. You're going to take digital circuits. I think complexity theorists, when they talk about Boolean circuits, they've never, they never use these symbols, ever. Although if you've ever done anything with digital circuits, you're probably quite familiar with these. Right? The and is the jellyfish. The or is the spaceship, and then the not is the pizza, right? So uh, you take all these, and you do it like that, and then you and these two together, right? Then you put those into some big circuit that ors them, right? Something like this. Uh, basically what happens is imagine this sequence of, of digits were, were anything other than this exact sequence, okay? It's going to be all anded. It's going to turn off one of these ands, which is going to turn off this and which is going to put a 0 into here, right? But if it's exactly this sequence, it's going to put a 1 into there, right? So what is going to happen is when you put a specific sequence, it's going to you have a bunch of ors here. It's going to be 0, 0, 0 for these in incoming wires. And then there's suddenly just going to be a 1 at the correct wire, and the others are going to be 0, right? And then you put the negations here, whether, you want the, whether your value of your truth table is 1 or a 0, right? And doing something like this, you can encode uh, you can convert any truth table into a circuit. Really kind of trivial thing. But given a specific Boolean function and, it's, and you have the truth table, congrats, you now have a circuit. What is the size of this circuit? The 
how do you define is it? Because before it was in your system, if there's n circuits, the size n. How is it defined here? Is it? In oh, great question. It's the input, the number of input wires. Okay. The inputs are n inputs, and actually, I already I did already say it's n to the n. Right. So there's two to the n rows. In each row, you have a linear amount. OK, there's no big, the, we're fixing, the, you can unfix the AND gate size and talk about that complexity. But let's suppose we fix the AND gate in fan in, not arbitrary fan in. Uh, then you could, this AND would just be a bunch of ANDs, right? So at each row, you add a linear amount of these circuits in terms of the number of input wires. Because this is linear, this is N input wires, but there's two to the N of them. So it's going to be, it's going to be this, you do this for every row. And the topology for each row is, all, of course, going to be different. But you do this for every row. You create a circuit of size 2 to the n, n 2 to the n. Right? Any questions on this construction? Can we do better than this? If you had to guess, can we do better? Yes. By how much? So that it's not exponential. The best known upper bound, I think, is by Lupinov in 1952. I don't know of a better upper bound, but it's actually 2 to the n over n. Still exponential, so it's less exponential. And it requires just a slightly more creative conversion. You can do a uh, kind of inductive argument on the truth table to get this out. Um, but you're not squeezing that much more out. You're getting. You're concerned in, as a function of n, the input. This is the best upper bound. Uh, but it, it would be really happy if we have a matching lower bound. And it turns out we do. Uh, and that's really the whole point of today, is to prove um, the shannon muller theorem. Um, and of course, Shannon was the guy who invented circuits. He was able to show uh, most circuits have uh, no, let me, let me stop. Most Boolean functions require circuits of size uh, 2 to the n over n. So most Boolean functions have exponential size circuits. Uh, contrast this immediately with the result we just showed, that if a polynomial time computation exists, it has a polynomial size circuit. If you go the other direction, you start with the function rather than the computation. You just define what the inputs and outputs should be. A function, by the way, is not a program. It doesn't tell you how to achieve it in, a, in a, an efficient manner. It just tells you what the inputs and outputs should be. If you start top down and you consider all the Boolean functions, most of them have exponential size circuits. Okay? First remark. It contrasts with the fact that efficient computations have efficient circuits. Second remark, this is kind of like an average case result. It doesn't say all circuits have exponential complexity, because obviously they don't. You can always obviously create a, a linear size circuit, and then it has to compute some function. So there you go. There's one that's not exponential size. But most of them require uh, this thing. So it's kind of like an uh, average case result. Um, the proof of this is actually. Uh, a very simple combinatorial counting argument. And it's kind of, in, in my opinion, it's in the spirit of the Kolmogorov complexity kind of arguments, uh, where we showed most strings were incompressible, right? So you can actually kind of argue about incompressibility with just through, again, with counting arguments, right? Uh, why are most files not compressible to one bit? You know, like, uh, the function would like, collide, and you wouldn't be able to, it wouldn't be like, Going to go back. Exactly. You have two bits, two possible files of one bit. You have n files bigger than one bit, so you can't compress them all in a way that you can uncompress them lossily, right? Same thing. We're going to show that there's how many. There's not that many circuits that are smaller than this. There's a very few amount of circuits that are smaller than this, but there's a ton of Boolean functions. There's way more Boolean functions than there are circuits. That's basically the proof. So what we're going to prove is we're going to compute the following value. We're going to compute uh, the number of circuits of size uh, 2 to the n over n. And we're going to divide that by the number of Boolean functions. OK? 
Right? That's the value we want to compute. And convince yourself, first of all, if we, took the, if we computed this value and we took the limit as n goes to infinity, and if that value goes to zero, we've proved the theorem. There are way more Boolean functions than there are circuits if we take the limit of n, and that is sufficient for us to prove way more functions than circuits, so not every, circuit can have a, not every function can have a small circuit. That's sufficient to prove it. Okay, first the easy part. How many Boolean functions are there of n bits? Fix n. How many Boolean functions are there? This one may surprise you. Sorry, what was the question? How many Boolean functions? You have an n-bit Boolean function. So f is a function. It takes on uh, n bits and outputs one bit. Right? Uh, what is the number of such Boolean functions on n inputs? Could, could it be the number of two tables? How many truth tables? Exact, each Boolean function is described by a truth table. So now we need to consider the number of possible truth tables. 2 to the 2 to the n. Perfect. Why? Each truth table has size, is characterized by a string of length 2 to the n. So now we need to consider the number of possible binary strings of length 2 to the n, which is going to be 2 to the 2 to the n. Not 2 to the n, but 2 to the 2 to the n. This is the number of possible Boolean functions. Now we need to compute the number of possible, uh, not, not only just compute the possible number of circuits, but give an upper bound on the possible number of circuits. So we give an upper bound, we take the limit, everything's going to work out, right? Uh, as long as the upper bound goes to zero, the limit goes to zero, we can ignore constants and so on, right? Uh, everything's going to work out nicely for us. So how many Boolean circuits are there? Um, well, consider what a circuit is, right? Let's say we have a gate. Consider uh, the topology of the circuit is fixed, and just let's just consider the number of possible gates that we have, right? So let's say, uh, suppose we have uh, 10, uh, not 10, n inputs, t gates, right? And then take your circuit and like zoom in on just one gate, okay? We have one gate. All right. Um, each gate is like a node in a directed acyclic graph. How many possible gates types are there? You can choose each node to be one element of the basis and or not, or whatever the basis is. Let's just call it B, size of B, because that's the number of possible choices we have for each gate. Okay. Then each gate also has two input wires to choose from. And this is the topology. So not just uh, the circuit is not just characterized by the selection of the gates, but the wiring as well. So it depends on how you wire them is really what the circuit is. How many choices are there for a wire? How many possible other gates can you choose from? You can either choose a gate or you can choose an input, but you can't choose yourself. So it's either gates... Or inputs, but not yourself. Do we agree with that one? That's the amount of choices you have for this first wire. Uh, well, same thing for the bottom, right? Now, how many of these circuits are good doesn't matter, because you could define something weird, like, like that's a gate, and then this is the output of some other gate. Uh, you could just do that, right? Might not make sense. Uh, to do that, but that's allowed here, right? Uh, we're just trying to get an upper bound. So certainly, the number of possible gates like this is going to be what? It's going to be t plus n, n minus 1, squared, size of b. Do we agree with that one? That's the number of possible ways we can have a gate. Now, how many gates are there? Three? Oh, sorry, I thought you meant like there's and, there's or, there's not. That is my favorite basis, yes. But we're just going to do B so I can ignore the constant later. Because I, when I did the proof, I wrote a 3 down, and then I forgot where the 3 came in, came from later on. So I'm just going to put a B there. Um, if we have T gates, then the number of circuits we have is going to be like uh, T plus N minus 1 squared size of b, this is going to be to the t, right? Because you choose each gate to be 
uh, t. And then this is what I'm talking about when I'm saying combinatorics, okay? This proof is all combinatorics. We're just counting things. Um, and this, this, this period in complexity theory gets personally more annoying. Even though I like combinatorics, I have a published paper on combinatorics. It's just, it can be annoying. It can be, uh, it's not as fun, I think. This is the number of, if we choose each, if we have t gates, and we choose each gate this way, then this is the number of circuits. But there is a small counting problem here that we've done. We've implicitly chosen the gates in an order. Like you choose, like this is what happens when you choose how many strings of length n, binary strings of length are there to the n, because you assume the digits have an order. But the gates don't have an order. So you need to divide by the number of permutations you could permute the gates in, because we've overcounted by quite a bit. And that is going to be, uh, what, t factorial, right? So this is an upper bound of the number of, just to be clear what we're doing, we're trying to get an upper bound on the number of gates, excuse me, the number of circuits to compute specific Boolean functions of t gates, right? And then later we'll replace t with what we need and, and, and solve it. Um, you guys remember Stirling's approximation of, to gun to your head? Do you remember what it is? What is it? Stirling's approximation? So I know Stirling numbers of the first kind, of the second kind. Stirling's approximation, I, I, I have heard of it. Um, is it some sum? No. It's not sum. I think the proof requires a sum, though. Oh, it's some approximation of t factorial? Yes, using non-factorial symbols. You can use functional, more functional devices. To use binomial coefficients? It's related. Just to tell you the answer, and hopefully you commit this to memory, because I, I have accidentally done it. It's 1 over the square root of 2 pi t, uh, t over e to the t. Um, it's not equals, but it's like before big O. It's very close to this, uh, asymptotically approximately that. Okay? I'm going to replace that in there, but I'm going to just ignore the square root of t part, because there's no way that's going to matter. And that's just going to make it uglier. So pretend there's no square root of t here. I'm going to ignore it and continue the proof. Um, so we get, we, if we plug that into that, what do we get? We get uh, t minus, t plus n minus 1 to the 2t, uh, b to the t, and I'm just going to leave it as letter b, but it should be the size of the set b, over, well, we have a t to the t and an e to the t. This is like t to the t over e to the t, right? So, but when we put one over t factorial, there's going to be e to the t on top and a t to the t on the bottom, right? Um, well, I want to pull out a t here, and I want to merge these two together, right? So what is that going to be? That's going to be um, t to the 2t, 1 plus n minus 1 over t to the 2t. Do we agree that's legal? Pulled out a 2t, and then I pulled out a t from here and a t from here. That I pulled out the t from, right? Then I have a b to the t and an e to the t. And this is still all over uh, t to the t, right? Well, I have a t to the t and a t to the 2t. 2t minus t is t. So I have a t to the t. And that's going to give me t to the t. Uh, b e to the t, 1 minus, 1 plus n minus 1 over t to the t, right? What do we know about the relationship between n and t? n, number of inputs. t, number of gates. What do we know about the relationship between the number of gates and the number of inputs? t to the t can have two inputs? No. So, uh, the number yes. of inputs? Yes, that's true, but that's not the answer. Number of inputs is larger than if a circuit looks like this, if a circuit looks like this, right, you have n input wires, you need at least n minus 1 gates to recognize the input wires, right? If you don't, then each circuit basically has to have at least n minus 1 gates. Otherwise, some of the wires aren't being read, which is actually, turns out it's fine. But most useful algorithms, you care about those input wires, right? You, 
every algorithm has a sub has a linear time lower bound unless it doesn't read the, the whole input. Um, so we know then that t is usually much greater than n minus one, right? So we know that this value here, n minus one over t, is probably going to be less than two. Excuse me, less than one, right? So we know that one plus something less than one is probably going to be less than two. So we can actually bound this whole thing by uh, an even greater upper bound, which is going to be t to the t, uh, be to the t, uh, two to the t. Oh, excuse me, there's a two here, two t here. Two to the two t, right? Now, what is this? Um, I don't want to work through the math anymore, but I'm, going to, I'm just going to say this is some constant c to the t, t to the t. Does it make sense? I pull the 2 in there, and I do something, and the 4 goes in there, and then the, there's a 4 be, and I don't want to deal with the 4 and the b and the e anymore. So let's just say that's what it is, right? So c t to the t to the t, OK? Now, we want to, again, we want to compute what? We want to compute the number of circuits of size n over 2 to the n over n. So what we do is we just choose t to be n to the 2 to the n, OK? Um, what is that going to be? That's going to be uh, c to the 2 to the n over n times 2 to the n over n to the 2 to the n over n. Oh, OK. Um, there's a multiplication there. I'm going to pull one of those out. I'll just put it here. C to the 2 to the n over n. 1 over n to the 2 to the n over n. And then we have 2 to the n, 2 to the 2 to the n over n. Right? These have the same power, 2 to the n over n and 2 to the n over n. So we're going to merge those. That's going to give us c over n, 2 to the n over n, um, times 2 to the 2 to the n. Uh, no, there's a, there's a missing n here. It's 2 to the n, to the 2 to the n to the over n, right? Any mistakes so far? We agree? There's missing minus signs, nothing there. This is, this is correct, right? Now, we have, a, we have a, a power, what is it, when you know the power rule, there's one of those power rules. There's an n there, and there's a divide by n there. Those are going to cancel. c over n to the 2 to the n over n to the 2 to the 2 to the n. Okay? I'm going to leave it here for a second. This is, what is this, what is this again? This is going to be the number of circuits of size 2 to the n over n. The number of circuits of size 2 to the n over n is this number, OK? Now, we want to compute that we want to show that the ratio is going to go to 0 as we take the limit of the number of Boolean functions with respect to the number of possible circuits. There's way less circuits than there are Boolean functions. So what do we do here? We just divide by the number of Boolean functions. So we have, again, I'll write it out, c over n, 2 to the n over n, 2 to the 2 to the n, over the number of Boolean functions. What's the number of Boolean functions again? 2 to the 2 to the n. Yes, 2 to the 2 to the n. What a coincidence. That's what we have here. Oh, look at that. Oh, surprise. Acting surprise. And then that gives us just the, that the ratio of the number of circuits of size 2 to the n over n and the number of total Boolean functions is going to be c over n to the 2 to the n over n. So this is the ratio. If we take the limit, what do we know about this function? n goes to infinity limit? Yeah, take the limit, n increase is arbitrarily large. Yeah, what do we know? So isn't that 2 to the n goes to infinity, divided by infinity, that's indeterminate? Mm, but remember, think about not infinity, because we can't think about Boolean functions with infinite value, but a limit to infinity. 2 to the n is going to grow way faster than n. Oh, okay. okay, I see. So this number is going to get much bigger than it will get smaller. But this thing, this is a C is a constant. And this is going to get small. This is, this is going to get real big. That means 1 divided by something real big is going to get real small. So you're getting, this whole number is going to get real small. Really, really small. This is going to go, the limit is going to be 0. That might take a second of convincing, right? I need to actually 
legally maybe do L'Hopital's rule or something. But you should perhaps believe me that the limit of this, I promise, will go to zero. Okay? You may be familiar with the limit of E is defined similar to this. It's like 1 plus n over 1 over n or something like this. Uh, and that doesn't go to zero. That goes to a certain limit. Either way, this going to zero, uh, it tells us the important part. It tells us what we want. It tells us the bottom has to be bigger than the top. Right? If the bottom is bigger than the top, there's more functions than there are circuits. So by a simple counting argument, we know that there are no, there's no way that every function can have a small circuit. This is not even a small circuit. This is a big circuit, a medium-ish, an exponential but slightly less circuit. Most of the circuits, therefore, have to not, there's, there's, there's too few circuits of this size. Most of them, therefore, can't have, get, most of them don't get a circuit. Most of them have to have even bigger circuits then. And that concludes the proof of the theorem that most Boolean functions require circuits greater than 2 to the n over n. Right. Any questions on this proof? This is Shannon Mueller lower bound is the first real argument in uh, circuit complexity. And the main theorem for today. This is probably, in my opinion, the most successful result in circuit complexity because it doesn't really, and it was also early. Um, the first uh, like complexity theoretic proof of circuit complexity came uh, in the mid '80s. Um, there's this paper uh, that finally was able to prove a lower bound. Oh, real quick, this doesn't. This is a counting argument. It doesn't say. It doesn't give us a lower bound on any explicit function. It just says it's impossible that all these functions have small circuits. Some of them have to have big circuits. It doesn't give us a specific lower bound on a specific function. This doesn't give us any intuition on how to show SAT might not have a small circuit, or any specific function has a small circuit. But there are some functions that were studied originally that uh, people thought, you know, maybe this is going to, we, we can study these functions first, and that can be a warm up to proving something like SAT. Um, so the functions that were first studied were, uh, the parity function, which is just you XOR all the bits. Then there's like the threshold function. We know that the threshold function of at, at least two of its wires are on, of the n wires. We know that this has to have circuit complexity of 2 to the n minus 4. That's like the best lower bound we have. We, that's the only lower bound we have for that one. Um, the best lower bound for an explicit function is uh, stood for 30 years. It was like 3 to the n minus little o of n. Okay, uh, that's terrible of a circuit lower bound. It's ridiculously bad. Um, and it was recently improved in like 2014. It was like 3 plus 1 over 86 uh, n minus O of n. Again, nothing. It's pathetically bad of a lower bound. We have been really, really bad about proving circuit lower bounds. The first circuit lower bound really proved, okay, so we have parity, we have threshold, we have majority, you know, the majority of the bits are a certain value and so on. Um, really simple circuits that have simple combinatorial structure in there, and nothing like SAT. Um, the first real circuit lower bound result was by uh, first Sachs and Sipser in 1984. And the reason I mention this is for two reasons. One's because it's the first one uh, I could think of. Uh, first is Merrick first. He's, he taught algorithms last semester. He's floating around the department somewhere. Sachs, no idea. Sipser wrote the book. And we follow this book. So that's another reason I, I, I like the result. And what they basically showed was that parity, the parity function, was not in a class of circuits called AC0. And AC0 basically means a parity um, cannot be computed in constant depth polynomial sized. Uh, circuits. So first off, let's remark it about how limited the model, how ridiculously limited the model is. What we talk about p slash poly, we're talking about polynomial size circuits. Recall that kind of like the depth of the circuit appears to be the running time in our construction, the Cook-Levin style construction. Um, circuits also have a kind of parallelism to them because you can compress depths of it if you, there are two operations which can be computed in parallel. You can grow the circuit fatter but not deeper. So AC0 represents, and it doesn't matter what AC1 and what that actually means, but just think of it as a class that the circuit size is polynomial simultaneously while the depth is constant. 
So you're computing these n-bit parities in a fixed depth. Obviously, that seems, that seems like an incredibly obvious statement to me. Like, you have a circuit, it no circuit, in fact, I think should be an AC0. It's, I couldn't even think of one if you asked me. Um, so constant depth circuits, growing out fatter and fatter, but not deeper and deeper, seems like it can't compute a lot of things. Parity is a super, ridiculously simple function. It is probably the simplest Boolean function you can think of, besides all ones, all zeros, right? It's the most trivial function. In fact, if you change a single bit of the input, the whole output has to change. It's incredibly sensitive. It's a very, very ridiculously simple function. It has a ridiculously simple structure. And it took a monumental uh, leap of science in order to show what is, I think, an incredibly trivial result. It doesn't have constant depth circuits. Um, and the reason I mention this is because the technique used was, uh, was insane. It was called the method of random restriction. And you take the circuit and you restrict a few of the bits and you consider like a probability distribution and some crazy things. And what they actually did, uh, Sipser has some comment about this, how he actually considered the case of an infinite parity function. Like it has infinitely many input bits and it, you define the infinite parity function as a single bit flips, then the output has to flip. Something like this. And then solving the infinite case using descriptive set theory ended up being easier than solving this, and then that helped them find the solution for this. Um, this was the first result, uh, I think, of a circuit lower bound, and it's a ridiculously bad one. Uh, then there were some people, you know, they tried to do certain things like this. They, they tried to show nothing close to SAT, but simple, ridiculous functions like this, like parity, threshold, majority, very, very simple structure. And the point of these, of course, is that you can in, do proof by induction on them. That's the, the interior structure you know has to follow an induction kind of style. Um, Uh, there was a guy named Hastad, and he proved uh, the Hastad switching lemma, which he ended up winning an award for. And the whole point of me right now is just rambling about this, because I don't want to do any of the proofs, because the, switching, the proof of the switching lemma has been iterated and improved upon, but it's still like seven dense dictionary pages. It's still, it, it would take like three lectures to get through the proof of the switching lemma. And it's just combinatorial counting arguments and so on. But among the, the switching lemma allows you to get a tighter bound on uh, the depth of the computing the, the, the circuits required for computing the parity function. And he was able, using the switching limit, you can prove that, the, that parity requires uh, circuits of size uh, n to the omega of k to the 1 over uh, k minus 1, where k, mi where k is de of de for, get for depth k. Another reason I mention this is that is that Hastad won a Godel Prize uh, for this lemma because it's it's massive and it there's an immediate contrast here between things we've done in early complexity theory like Savage's theorem and things like this. Savage's theorem immediately shows p space equals n p space. Awesome. We have shown a very trivial, impossible, like ridiculous lower bound uh, that you could have maybe even assumed and gotten away with on a simple function. So. We did not have any success proving any circuit lower bounds uh, in this period. And this was 1984. And we went through uh, revisions of proofs like these and, and, and these kind of combinatorial arguments. And you know, there's a lot of combinatorics that you can use. And people kept br bringing in new tools and techniques that have been developed with combinatorics and graph theory and counting arguments and so on to try and solve these problems on circuits. Um, but then uh, in the 90s, there was this a uh, thing called the natural proofs barrier, which kind of ruined it, this, uh, this golden era of incredibly weak theorems. It's by Razbarov and Rudich. Uh, it's called the natural proofs barrier. So there was this golden age of these circuit lower bound proofs that really proved nothing. They proved something, something insignificant, ridiculous lower bound. And you, know, you wrote a paper on some terrible, convoluted, many page argument to show it. Um, and Razbarov and Rudich noticed that a lot of these proofs have the same structure. So basically, like, um, uh, you define a property, a property on Boolean functions, like uh, what is the ones I have? Discrepancy. 
uh, variation. Scatter. Um, uh, show that p uh, slash poly uh, is simple. So like, here's a, this is a, a quote unquote proof strategy using circuit lower bounds, an attempted repeated proof strategy using circuit lower bounds to show p does not equal np. First, define a property on Boolean functions. Then show that p slash poly is simple with respect to whatever that property is. It has low discrepancy. It has low scatter. Doesn't even matter what those mean. Um, show uh, sat is complex. OK, well, if sat is complex, sat has high discrepancy, sat has high scatter, it can't be in uh, p slash poly. Because p slash poly is characterized by the, the Boolean functions that have low discrepancy or low rank or whatever, right? And then you can conclude just from that kind of proof strategy that p, sat is not in p slash poly because it's complicated, but p slash poly, p slash poly is simple. This is an attempted proof strategy at p versus np repeatedly. This was the hope of all these uh, kind of circuit lower bounds techniques. And every single one of them had this kind of structure. They had a natural property. By the way, you have to show p slash poly is a simple by induction. Right? It, it's really natural to, to define induction on these efficient circuits, right? Um, so like if your property uh, was natural, and they defined what a natural property is, and I don't want to get into it, it's too technical, but they said if your property discrepancy or whatever was natural, it satisfied these kind of gene generic properties, uh, then uh, this proof would fail. Um, in some sense, what they're proving here is that there is no natural proof of p does not equal np. And they showed that all these circuit lower bounds uh, would fail to resolve p versus np. This is a second barrier to the p versus np question besides the relativization one. Last time we showed relativization proofs, most problems appear to relativize. Uh, and those all fail to um, separate p from np or show p versus np. Uh, this one is sort of conditional, though. It is a second barrier in a second historical era in solving p versus np. And, uh, you know, we're kind of stuck in the mud now. Basically, the way it works is like, um, if uh, p does not equal np, then cryptography exists. Like, we rely on cryptography. Uh, the, the built, cryptography is built on the assumption that p does not equal np. But specifically, if p does not equal np, then it is computationally in, in, infeasible to distinguish the, the true random from the pseudo-random. So among this period of history, the complexity theorists also were able to build pseudo-random generators. Um, and using the assumption that p does not equal np, they were able to give guarantees that it's hard to tell these two apart. You know, True randomness is expensive, but pseudo-randomness is easy. You have some small seed, and then you seed a program, and it, it spits out random-looking bits. And the, the, it's difficult to tell true randomness and pseudo-randomness apart um, only if p does not equal np. That kind of seems like to make sense, because if p does not equal np, if p equals np, then they're sat, and all these np-complete problems are also np. And although the pseudo-random number generators are not built on np-complete problems, all these things that appear to be uh, one way, like encryption and so on, you, they only go one direction. Uh, uh, again, some things I'm saying here might be technically wrong if you get into it enough, but I want to uh, give a high-level picture of what is actually a very difficult uh, barrier. And unlike the relativization barrier, there's no way we, we could cover the proof of the natural proofs in this course. Um, but basically, if p does not equal np, then it's computation infeasible to distinguish the random from the pseudorandom. The reason I'm saying this is like, uh, if a natural proof existed to show p does not equal np, such a proof could distinguish 
the true random from the pseudo random. At a high level argument, that's basically what it is. First off, notice that this is not as much like an independent res result as the relativization barrier is, okay? Relativization barrier says you can't prove it using relativizing results, and you can't disprove it using relativizing results. This is a weirdly conditional kind of thing. We think P does not equal NP, and that's the way people, most people are trying to prove. They're not trying to prove P equals NP, okay? If P does not equal NP, then it's hard to distinguish the random from the pseudorandom. If there is a natural proof, though, that P does not equal NP, you can use that proof to distinguish the random from the pseudorandom, though. So there, then would, there exists a uh, probabilistic algorithm to distinguish between the random and the pseudorandom. But we think that should be hard if P does not equal NP. So basically, it's a, it's a one-sided barrier uh, to these circuit problems. And what it shows is like P versus NP is hard to prove using circuits, specifically because P does not equal NP. So the hardness of the problem relates to the hardness of, of proving itself. And, and that's really the sort of the moral here. And this was like 1997 or something. And I think they won the Godel Prize in 2009 for this work. This is why uh, in you know, the 2000s, P versus NP was made one of these millennial prize problems, why it's so hard. I don't think there's another problem in history that has, uh, like, uh, what is it, the hero's journey like this, like this, where you have people try, they think the problem is easy, they try and solve it, and then not only do they not solve it, but they prove they can't solve it doing this way. They switch directions. They switch, into, they switch tactics. They spend careers, you know, 84, 1984, and sometime before that to 1997. And they're still doing, they're still circuit proofs. Cir of course, still circuit lower bound proofs uh, every year. Um, uh, they, they, this whole field of research that people tried for 15 years, fruitless, basically. against the. It showed many other things, of course, but not the one that we care about, the only problem that we really care about, anything significant. And um, we were kind of out of juice. We don't have anything else left to do. I mean, there's, uh, we don't have any, there are almost no techniques that you can come up with that both escape the relativization barrier and now this natural proofs barrier. Uh, and this is what makes the problem so hard. We don't really have anything left to prove it. There was one result which proved that IP equals P space using the technique known as arithmetization. And it uses a fact about polynomials. You convert a computation history. We can convert it to a SAT formula. Instead of ands and ors, suppose you use multiplication and addition. You have a polynomial now. Um, then you can talk about polynomials, Fourier or whatever, right? You can do things with polynomials. Find the roots. And a, um, later on, in like 2009, uh, Aronson and Wigerson showed what's called the algebraization barrier. And such polynomial techniques would not even solve. People weren't as invested in the polynomial techniques, but such polynomial techniques would also fail to resolve P versus NP. So we literally have no idea how to solve the problem, and we've tried, you know, how many people's careers have been in, in one specific area? How many people have become expertises, became experts on specific kinds of circuit lower bound proofs, only to have Razbrov and Rudich come, on, come along and say, actually, that's not going to, you can't do it that way. It's not going to work that way. Uh, then what do you do? You spend 15 years trying to prove it this way, and now it doesn't work. What do you, I don't know what, I would know, I don't know what I would do. So uh, this is a very hard problem. Not only is it a hard problem, but we know how hard of a problem it is. Uh, and there's no way I was going to be able to cover any of those uh, proofs in a timely manner uh, in this course. It would take maybe two lectures to, to, to give one justice. And it would be kind of, kind of worse than this. You know? It's not in the, in the spirit of being fun, I think. So any questions on my little ramble about uh, the natural proofs barrier, about circuit lower bounds, why we don't have any? OK, last class is next time. See you guys.